now for a view from inside the White House of the Trump administration's first days in office. I'm joined by Kellyanne Conway, counselor to the president. Kellyanne Conway, welcome back to the program. I'm going to start with the fact that this administration is not even a week old and already the president of Mexico has canceled a visit he was going to make uh, next week saying he's not going to pay for this border wall. Is this the way the president wanted to have relationship between the U.S. and Mexico as his administration gets underway? As President Trump said today in Philadelphia when he addressed the House Senate Republican conference at their retreat, Judy, it was a mutual decision to postpone this trip. And I think that when these two leaders are ready to sit down and talk about a wide range of issues, they will do that. But let's look at the rest of the week. I mean, this has been a pretty remarkable week in just four work days. We've had uh, wage boosting, job creating measures. We've had manufacturing CEOs from all over the country here, really premier job creators, hearkening the really he heeding the president's call to try to have an explosion of manufacturing in our nation. And then on the very same day, we had labor union leaders, along with laborers themselves here at the White House, talking about what it means to them to be a carpenter, a pipe fitter, a plumber, a steel worker, like the many men I grew up with um, in South Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. And they, they said that they had never been invited to the White House before, Democratic or Republican. They felt so included that they're part of the national conversation. The president has issued executive orders withdrawing from TPP so that we have bilateral trade agreements in the future that benefit the United States and its workers and its allies and its interests. So it's been a very busy week. We're very happy to have our first foreign leader tomorrow, Prime Minister uh, Theresa May here meeting with President Trump. Well, we're, Kellyanne, let me, if I may you know, interrupt. We're very happy I, about that. Yeah, I do want to ask you about some of these things, but, but sticking with the Mexico story, because President of Mexico said it was his decision not to come, but what I want to ask you about is the, the border wall and paying for it. You had the White House press secretary tell reporters today that it was going to be paid for with a 20 percent tax imposed on Mexican goods coming into the U.S. Now, later, the White House said that was just one idea. That's Which, right. What is it? Which is it? That's right. That is one of the many methods by which to pay for the wall. It is one proposal on the table. Certainly, there are others. And, Judy, when you think of the price tag for this wall, which will be a physical wall constructed on the southern border, let's contrast that to the billions and billions that we spend um, on benefits for and accommodating illegal immigrants. You know, we this country spends billions of dollars protecting the borders of other countries around the world. It's high time we start protecting our own. We're a sovereign nation. And as President Trump has said all along, made a centerpiece of his campaign from day one. We have to stop the flow of people and drugs over our borders. What he also did by way of these executive orders this week in terms of building the wall was he has expanded the tools and the resources that our law enforcement officials and our brave men and women who are protecting that border, and we, they need tools and resources, and they should be respected. The detention areas will be larger and, to accommodate those and stop this catch and release, stop the sanctuary cities yeah, funding. If I can just interrupt, because, and I hate to do that, but I, I have a number of things I want to ask you about. We did report on all that last night. But the other thing the president did yesterday, in addition to uh, making the announcement you just dis discussed, is he talked about the sanctuary cities, so-called sanctuary cities, where undocumented immigrants uh, are given a, a different, um, a fairer treatment in the eyes of many. Today, we've seen a hundred American mayors say they are not going to go along with what the president said. With that kind of pushback, how is the president going to force these mayors who are saying this is an inhumane way to treat people who are here in this country as visitors? This issue of sanctuary cities goes to the heart of how Donald Trump himself has changed the whole way many Americans look at illegal immigration. For years, the question of fairness in illegal immigration went to one issue, what's fair to the illegal immigrant? And now people are asking, what's fair to the rest of us? What's fair to the American worker? What's fair to the safety and sanctity of people who live in some of these sanctuary cities? What's fair to Kate Steinle? That woman should be a household name. She should be known as a national treasure. This woman who was murdered in cold blood in front of her father in San Francisco by an illegal immigrant who had been deported five times, Judy. So how will the That's president... humane treatment of whom? Kate Steinle? No, I, and I hear you, and the president's spoken of her often, but how will the president force mayors who are saying they are going to take care of undocumented immigrants if they come into their cities? Because, frankly, they say the, the idea that, the, that most immigrants are committing crimes is just not true. Well, that is not what the president said. You're, they are conflating two different things. No one said that in terms of, uh, of the sanctuary cities 
defunding. The, they, I guess those mayors will have to find money somewhere else because they love when the money flows from the federal government here in Washington. So if they want to continue to flout and flagrantly violate the law and brag about it today publicly, then they should go ahead. But they're going to have to find their own money in doing so. And perhaps if they are no. violating the law, then we'll see what happens in the future. But you know, until me. then, it, you know, Judy, this is a here undocumented immigrants, and I hear about, say, again, what is fair to everyone? The people, the legal people, the American citizens who live there, our law enforcement who feels like they don't have all the resources and tools they need, um, and then, of course, our, our employment base, where people are saying, I'm people gonna, are tired of hearing that, uh, you know, a I'm going to interrupt you again. The jobs I'm sorry. Americans don't want to do. Apologize for continuing to interrupt, but I do want to move on. Syria, the president said in an interview yesterday, he wants to create safe zones for the rep people living in Syria. Wouldn't this require U.S. troops? And has he discussed it with uh, the senior national security members of his administration? He has discussed Syria in that regard with his uh, national security team, but his national security intelligence teams are being still being formed, as you know. Um, General Mattis will be, we hope, confirmed or sworn, excuse me, sworn in on the next day or so. And of course, we have Secretary Kelly now and the CIA director uh, also. But the thing is, he will meet with them, but he has been, President Trump has been very public about the fact that Aleppo is a humanitarian crisis that's been all but ignored by this country for far too long. And uh, he will meet with them and he will make final decisions, but he's been very public, including on a different network last night, Judy, about what options are very much on the table. Uh, and, and but not exactly in connection with that, but the president has also spoken about uh, the prospect of, of uh, torture, of enhanced interrogation. He said that it's something that he likes. We also saw yesterday, Kellyanne Conway, there, a draft executive order reported on that raises the prospect of reviving these CIA so-called black site prisons, where we know terrorism suspects were once detained and tortured. Now, I want to ask you about a story in the New York Times today, because the press secretary, Sean Spicer, said this is not, this draft order didn't come from the United, from, from the White House. But the New York Times quotes three different individuals who say that it did come from the White House, from the National Security Council office. So I guess my question is, why doesn't the White House simply acknowledge that this is where it came from? Because it didn't. That is not an official White House document, period, um, as I've been told. And uh, if it came from the NSC, if it came from others, you know, who are leaking documents. It certainly is not, that is not a White House document that has been discussed internally. So what the press secretary has said is true, uh, as far as I've been briefed. Well, both um, the on, on the broader issue of torture, though, it's important, because I think you said that the president said he likes it. What he said is that he's been informed by people very recently that it is a possible, a possibility that works. Um, you have other people, like his incoming Secretary of Defense, who said that, that he does not believe it works, that there are other tactics and both that could work just as well. So he will meet with his team and make a final decision on that. And both the defense secretary and the CIA director said they had never seen this this draft order until it was reported in the press. Well, that's why. And if it were a White House document, they certainly would have, because they are the secretary of our, his secretary of defense and his CIA director. So that helps answer the question as well. We, we know there a are few, lots of leaks everywhere. There's nothing we can do about that except not leak ourselves. A very few quick questions. I'm just going to ask you one right after another. This investigation into what the president calls widespread voter fraud, no credible evidence of this. Is anyone on the White House staff tried to talk the president out of doing this? Well, I won't reveal private conversations with the president, Judy, but I will tell you that what the president is talking about is registration of voter rolls. Um, he knows there are dead people registered, there are illegal people registered, and he wants to get to the bottom of that without an election on the horizon. Usually people get all exercised about electoral reform after something goes wrong or ballot integrity when we're about to have an election. So it's great that right after a successful election that he had, unexpected to most of the media, that he is looking at ballot integrity, one person, one vote, really the bedrock of our, of our democracy. And that's what he's talking but about. If, I've but, discussed this with him but if as there's recently no, as today. Again, pardon me, if there's no evidence of widespread voter fraud, couldn't this end up just like President Trump's longtime claim that President Obama was born outside the United States? No, I, I can't imagine why that would ever be raised um, on the same plane. But let me say this. Was, was the, were those same, same words used by anyone to describe Jill Stein and her 
fantasy of a recount based on, quote, voter fraud that she detected in Wisconsin and Michigan that ended up getting her millions of dollars in taxpayer, taxpayer dollars and a lot of well, platform on, by the media, perhaps even on your network. I mean, somehow that was a great idea by Jill Stein uh, for 70,000 votes because they didn't want to accept the election results that they didn't, they didn't expect well, and they wouldn't accept. So I, I just have to say the president is talking about registration and voter rolls, and I don't think anybody can deny that there are people who are registered to vote, there are people registered to vote in different states, there are people who are ineligible to vote either because they're dead and shouldn't vote. Um, you mentioned they the, are illegal and shouldn't be registered to vote. You mentioned the media. We know the president has been engaged in, I don't know of any other way to put it, than a long-running uh, battle with the media, has been very critical of much, if not most, of the, of the news media. Um, and today, uh, in the New York Times, it's running a story. Your colleague, uh, the White House chief strategist, Steve Bannon, said, uh, told the New York Times last night, he said the media is, quote, in his words, the opposition party, and that it should, quote, keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while. Does the president share that view? Well, there are other things Steve Bannon said in that interview in the New York Times, very rare interview. But what about that quote? Well, what, what, let's talk about what he meant there. What he's saying there is there's no evidence that anybody in the media learned anything from this election. There's no head that's rolled. There's, there's no division that said, wow, we really screwed this up by, by stating as facts that Hillary Clinton was going to win and that she was going to take the House and the well, Senate Well, in all her. fairness, Kellyanne Conway, most people we know in the Republican and Democratic parties looked at the public opinion polls and thought that that was going to be the outcome. Well, not in the Trump campaign, or we wouldn't have been sending him to Michigan, Wisconsin, um, certainly back to North Carolina, Pennsylvania. I had him in Pennsylvania well, three times a week. So we must have seen something that allowed us to influence the calendar where we were deploying our two greatest assets, Mike Pence and Donald Trump. But apart from that, uh, I, there is no evidence that, you know, we, when I look up at the screen on most stations, Judy, and I'm like the most open press person here, I would think, I look up at the screen and I see no difference between the way candidate Trump, president-elect Trump, and president Trump is being treated by many outlets. So it's should the, the media shut up and listen for a while? I think that I, I think Bannon that we said. should all, I think we should all learn to listen more to America. And that's probably Steve Bannon's central point, is that Donald Trump proved that he understood America in the way that those who say they're informing America simply did not. And it really takes listening. I mean, I was a professional pollster for 28 years. My job was to listen to people and, and take advice from them. Some of the best advice and insights I've ever received in my professional life have come from, most of them have come from people, by listening to them, by getting out of the bubble, by getting out of you know, our, our coastal media centers. And this is just said with, you know, a great deal of, I've tried on many different networks now, it doesn't get covered, um, people cherry pick one or two words, but I've tried many times now on different networks to say, I would like us to have an open relationship and a fair okay. and free press, but with a free press comes responsibility. And that responsibility comes in allowing us to, to ask the questions, like what are we missing about America? As I like to say, we, the Trump yeah. administration and the media are, have to co-parent this country, have joint custody of the country for the next eight years probably. Let's find a way to mutually coexist. By calling the president names, going on Twitter and saying snarky well, things about him, the president of the United States, that would never pass editorial muster on a network or in, or in the papers, really should be rethought. Well, we are, it's a big, big conversation, and it's early in the administration, and I know we're going to have opportunities to come back I'm happy to, to have it with you, Judy. Thank you. Kellyanne Conway, thanks.